This is from his first short story. It's called Dante and the Lobster. It's about a character, Rebecca wrote it in 1922, when he was about 18. It's about a character called Malacqua, taken from Dante's Divine Comedy, the name, not Patrick, not Mick, nothing like that. Someone from Dante, of course. Um, and he is making a sandwich. We encounter him making a sandwich to take to the pub, to have some drinks, to collect the lobster. Sorry, first the sandwich, then the lobster, then the pub, then the Italian lesson, then his auntie's house to eat the lobster. So we encounter him first, making the sandwich, or rather destroying the apartment, on his way to collecting the lobster. Balacqua on his knees before the flame, pouring over the grill, controlled every phrase of the cooking. It took time, but if a thing was worth doing at all, it was worth doing well. That was a true saying. Long before the end, the room was full of smoke and the reek of burning. He switched off the gas, when all that human care and skill could do had been done and restored the toaster to its nail. This was an act of dilapidation, for it seared a great wheel in the paper. This was hooliganism, pure and simple. What the hell did he care? Was it his wall? The same hopeless wallpaper had been there 50 years. It was livid with age. It could not be disimproved. <laughs> he leaves the house on his way to collect the lobster. Balacqua had a spavinated gait. His feet were in ruins. He suffered with them almost continuously. Even in the night they took over from the corns and hammer toes and carried on. So that he would press the fringes of his feet desperately against the end rail of the bed, or better again, reach down with his hand and drag them up and backwards towards the instep. Skill and patience could disperse the pain, but there it was, complicating his night's rest. Now, Black, of course, as I say, is about 18. When we get to the middle-aged Beckett characters, they are in such a state of disintegration, some of them are almost just disembodied voices. Now, <laughs> Balacqua, having collected the lobster, having spent his afternoon in the pub, arrives at his auntie's house for dinner. And this, I think, is the first example I read to you is an idea of the lack of concern for social nicety. The second one is an indication of the disintegration of the body. Here is an, an indication of the different poles coalescing, shall we say. The tragic and the comic in very close, almost indistinguishable accord. And this from an 18-year-old writer who had yet to reach anything like his full potential. Balacqua drew near to the house of his aunt. Let us call it winter. That dusk may fall now and a moon rise. At the corner of the street, a horse was down and a man sat on its head. I know, thought Balacqua, that that is considered the right thing to do. But why? His aunt was in the garden, tending whatever flowers die at that time of year. <laughs> she embraced him and together they went down into the bowels of the earth, into the kitchen in the basement. She took the parcel and undid it and abruptly the lobster was on the table, on the oilcloth discovered. They assured me it was fresh, said Balacqua. Suddenly, he saw the creature move. This neuter creature definitely had changed its position. His hand flew to his mouth. Christ, he said, it's alive. His aunt looked at the lobster. It moved again. It made a faint, nervous act of life on the oil cloth. They stood above it, looking down on it. Exposed cruciform on the oilcloth, it shuddered again. Balak felt he would be sick. My God, he whined, it's alive. What will we do? The aunt simply had to laugh. She bustled off to the pantry to fetch her smart apron, leaving him goggling down at the lobster, and came back with it on, and her sleeves rolled up all business. Well, she said, it is to be hoped so indeed. All this time, muttered Balak. Then, suddenly aware of her hideous equipment, What are you going to do? he cried. Boil the beast, she said. What else? <laughs> but it's not dead, protested Balacqua. You can't boil it like that. <laughs> she looked at him in astonishment. Had he taken leave of his senses? Have sense, she said sharply. Lobsters are always boiled alive. There must be. <laughs> she caught up the lobster and laid it on its back. It trembled. I feel nothing. 
In the depths of the sea, it had crept into the cruel pot. For hours, in the midst of its enemies, it had breathed secretly. It had survived a Frenchwoman's cat and his witless clutch. Now it was going alive into scalding water. It had to. Balakwa looked at the old parchment of her face, grey in the dim kitchen. You make a fuss, she said angrily, and upset me, and then lash it with your dinner. She lifted the lobster clean off the table. It had about 30 seconds to live. Well, thought Balakwa, it's a quick death. God help us all. It is not. You were laughing at some point. <laughs> Often, too, for comic purposes rather than side by side, Beckett sets opposition in op opposites in opposition, without the possibility of resolution or without either opposite offering a viable alternative. This from a radio play, in which an old couple are returning from the train station, and Mr. Rooney, who is slow on his feet in a state of dilapidation, is thinking about his choices of going to work and staying at home. Alone in the compartment, my mind began to work, as so often after office hours, on the way home, on the train, to the lilt of the bogies. Your season ticket, I said, costs you £12 a year, and you earn, on average, seven and six a day. That is to say, barely enough to keep you alive and twitching with the help of food, drink, tobacco, and periodicals until you finally reach home and fall into bed. Add to this, or subtract from it, rent, stationery, various subscriptions, tram fares to and fro, light and heat, permits and licenses, hair trims and shaves, tips to escorts, upkeep of premises and appearance, and a thousand unspecifiable sundries, and it is clear that by lying at home in bed, day and night, winter and summer, with a change of pyjamas once a fortnight, you would very considerably add to your income. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, I said, there are the horrors of home life. Digesting, sweeping, airing, scrubbing, waxing, waning, washing, mangling, drying, mowing, clipping, raking, rolling, scuffling, shoveling, grinding, tearing, pounding, banging and slamming. And the brats, the happy little healthy little howling neighbours brats. Of all this and much more, the weekend, the Saturday intermission and then the day of rest have given you some idea. What must it be like on a working day? <laughs> a Wednesday? A Friday? What must it be like on a Friday? <laughs> and I fell to thinking of my silent back street basement office with its rest couch and velvet hangings and what it means to be buried there alive, if only for ten to five, with convenience to the one hand a bottle of light pale ale and to the other a long ice cold fillet of fish. Nothing I said. Not even fully certified death can ever take the place of that. <laughs> <laughs>